lot of good stuff today. There's actually three people in the audience that are taking this course for honors, and I think on their transcript they'll say physiology of domestic animals, honors, or something like that. And part of the deal is they have to give uh, over the semester three presentations up front here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some white blood cells, and then we'll start with the student presentation. It'll be about five minutes each. And of course, when your fellow students up here, it's just as testable for tomorrow as anything, right? Anybody have any questions first, though, before we get into some material? We're still immunology, and you can study it for 10 years and wouldn't grasp everything about immunology. So we're skimming the surface. And on one of my lists here, I have it up here. I know I talked about titer, and uh, we'll see at the end. Maybe I'll have another illustration. But I want a little bit about white blood cells. It's confusing. It's uh, it's not like red blood cells. There's one type. Platelets. There's one type. There's many types of white blood cells, and sometimes not everybody agrees what to call them. Okay. But I want to make sure for tomorrow that you know the basic stuff. And then if we we'll, if we find some complicated things, I'll say I, we don't really go there because like you've heard of a T cell, I and mean, hopefully in the, your brain that you know it's programmed in the thymus, that's what the T is for. And the thymus says you live or you die, and if you die, that's apoptosis, right? We said that word before. This is spelled just like it sounds, A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S. That's kind of like when a cell, a cell is told to self-destruct, apoptosis. So when the thymus sees a potential T cell that it knows it's going to attack the body, then it says, no, you can't get out of here, OK? So it's like the selection process. So what I did, I pushed my right button here. And of course, I went to Google, but I did this before I started this. Let's see. I did leukocytes. And it is kind of confusing, but I'll, we'll do um, a few of the simple ones, and then we'll go more complicated, OK? And I'll tell you, you know, like the internet's a big library, but there's no librarians. So some of the stuff is incomplete, but if you know your stuff, you can go, well, they forgot this or they forgot that. So let me do this one, this types of leukocytes, it's very big. And oh, by the way, I got my chrome back. Uh, it's hard to explain, but remember how I couldn't start up chrome and finally somebody, none of the first line or second line of defense that I tapped could help me, but it ends up being one of the gurus over there said, oh, do you know what, one of your uh, drives is getting near a thousand gigabytes. What's a thousand gigabytes? Is that a terabyte? A terabyte. Terabyte? Yeah, so I had almost a terabyte of information in this one place and was like clogging things up. So anyway, so here's a simple one. Uh, they're stained. First of all, if you looked under a microscope of blood, you would never see this color. So this is part of histology. Most tissue that you see under the microscope are stained and they'll give you maybe some false color because in the real life, white blood cells are basically white and there's no differentiation, but that's okay. But you know they all have a nucleus, but sometimes they don't have a nice little round nucleus like we're used to. Sometimes a nucleus looks like it's on drugs, okay? Or that it went to IU and then came back. <laughs> this is being recorded too, okay. Now look at these first three. They all end in fill, because fill means like, right? And basophils like basic stain. <laughs> so years ago, they named oh, this type of white blood cell likes basic stain. So it's called a basophil. Then this eosinophil, I skipped that middle one, is really likes acidic stain. And then the neutrophil didn't really like any of them, years ago at least, okay? But I want to look at the neutrophil. Here's the nucleus. There's a blob, there's a little this eyelid of tissue there, another little blob, another little blob. That's one nucleus. So really kind of weird looking. Uh, but those three are grouped together and they're called granulocytes. And we'll probably run into that word, but granulo, G-R-A-N-U-L-O, granulocytes. <laughs> Well, then we've got a monocyte. And one thing about monocytes is 
sometimes when the histologists see that cell in the blood, it's called a monocyte. But when it does extravasation, right, and goes uh, outside the blood vessel, and it's, if it's located in a tissue, a lot of times it's called a macrophage. So a monocyte becomes a macrophage. <coughs> and then lymphocytes, they're missing one. So now here's a good little quiz question. They've got T cells and B cells for lymphocytes. What's missing? NK cells, okay? So you gotta be careful out there. Maybe the person that did this didn't know that. NK cells are a little different because when they are made, they don't have to be programmed, but they're a very small percent in the body, so maybe this person was saying, I'm only talking about big things, I don't know, right? And then the T cell there is for the thymus, and the B cell, at least in mammals, they get programmed in bone marrow, and then Grace today is gonna to tell us about where in birds where they get programmed, but we'll get to that shortly. Okay, so there's a pretty simple one, pretty straightforward. And then you get people that do this. That's not going to be very big. Let me just find a bigger one here. Um, don't get confused, but I just want to show you how confusing it is. And although this has a nice little word, <laughs> copy down that word on top, hematopoiesis. I guess I could dim this a little bit here. Uh, hopefully, as we go along, you can define words you've never seen before if you know the parts. Hamato means blood. H-E-M-A-T-O, right? Hoesis usually means producing. So this is producing blood in humans. And again, there are some species differences. But this is, this is actually not too bad because over here, they talk about the simple <coughs> ones, the thrombocytes and the red blood cells. But they tell you at the beginning, all blood cells have a nucleus. All blood cells have a nucleus at the very beginning when they're made. But when they get in the blood, you know red blood cells in the mammal doesn't have a nucleus. And you know platelets don't have a nucleus when they get in the blood. And this little diagram shows you what happens. So it's kind of neat. Let's look at the thrombocyte. I know this isn't maybe as big as it could be, but very on the far left, I'll make it a little bigger. You finally get this what's called a megakaryocyte. It's kind of like a mother cell, and then little, I hate to say babies, but there's like little particles chipping off of it, and that's how we get platelets, thrombocytes. So thrombocytes are really a little fragment of a big cell, no nucleus. Then the urethrocyte, here we end up, but notice it has a nucleus up there. And then there's a lot of stages that go through. If you're a hematologist, you know every one of those stages. Because then in certain disease states, these start showing up in the blood too much. And you'll go, there are too many of X cells. Okay? So if you're a hematologist, you would know, you would know this backwards and frontwards, and you see them on the microscope or in a tissue biopsy. You can kind of talk about things. Well, then here's those basophil, neutrophil, and eosinophil, right? Okay, so those, you can't see it, but it says granulocytes there, which I just spelled out. Then over here, there's a mast cell, okay? Uh, and some people, and then some diagrams, some people think this mast cell came from a basophil. Now, this person did not think that. That's a controversial thing. Some, you'll see some books, basophils differentiate into a mast cell. And you know the mast cell is a floating drugstore, right? We talked about that yesterday. Type 1 hypersensitivity. Then we got the monocytes over here. And look at, they agree with me. It goes to a macrophage. And then you might want to write down it goes to a dendritic cell also. And these are other cells that are kind of like, well, they're not really phagocytic, but they're important in the immune system. And I think one of our videos talks about it. So monocytes can go to macrophage. And you know the macrophage is a super eater. It can re regenerate its own blood, uh, not blood supply, its energy and go and work and work and work. 
And you know the other uh, phagocytic cell there is that neutrophil, right? It's a short-lived cell. It doesn't, it comes like with one battery, and once that battery is spent, it's dead, right? And this is where pus is made, right? These, there's a lot of these. They get out of the, and we'll talk, and yeah, somebody will, will talk about that. Okay, so then way over here, then what's left has to be the lymphocytes. So this is not a bad diagram. So they talk about a common one here. And so there's that natural killer cell kind of off by itself. And then over here, they talk about the B cell and T cell. And the B cell differentiates to a plasma cell, and it's this cell that makes the antibodies, right? Pumping out thousands and thousands. And then here's one kicker. Once you differentiate, no matter where it is, you never can go back. So like a plasma cell, can't say, I'm done now, I'm gonna go back and be a B cell. You never can go back. You differentiate, you do your job, and then you're spent. Now what this doesn't show is all the other types of lymphocytes. There's B memory cells. There's T memory cells. There's T helper cells. There's T cytotoxic cells. There are T delay type hypersensitive cells. I probably won't <coughs> ask you anything about that tomorrow because look at how complicated that got. But depending on how you counted it up, look at how many white blood cells are there, 15? So it's confusing, but not every diet, but this is not bad. But it does, you know, I've never asked you these stages, but if you're into hematology, you would know those backward and forward because in certain disease states, they would show up more prevalent. So, kind of neat. Um, so, yeah, we got some good presentations. Grace, why don't you come down and you're going to talk about the bursa. Are you going to help us pronounce that word too? Yeah, I can try. Excellent. Because I did look it up too on a Google. We'll, we'll let you help us first. And then here's, you know, that little green line. Here's the, um, so I'll let you, you know, you're going to point it in right above that thing right there. Go ahead and find your presentation. So it won't take long to find that. Anybody have any questions on the white blood cells? Why Grace is trying to her presentation on the bursa of something that's in birds? Oh, I know what. Okay, what? You got to go. Ahead. Yeah, question. So the NK cells, they're only a part of the innate immune system, right? Right, the natural killer cells. That's that little subtype of lymphocyte. It's an innate system because it doesn't have to be programmed. It's When it's born, it knows get like cancer cells or whatever. And don't ask me exactly how that does it, you know what I mean? Okay, so um, Grace, take it away. All right, so since we've been learning about the immune system this week and last week, I'm gonna teach you guys a little about the bursa of Habertius, which is a part of the immune system unique to avians. Okay, say that, say it again. Bursa of? Fabricius. Fabricius, okay. Yeah. My tongue has trouble with that one. There's a couple ways of pronouncing it. Okay, okay, good. So I'll say bursa of F, and then that's another way to pronounce it. <laughs> so by definition, the bursa of Fabricius is a dorsal diverticulum in the proctodial region of the cloaca. That's a mouthful. To break that down, we'll go ahead and use some scientific terms in their roots. First of all, we know that dorsal refers to the upper side or back of an animal as in the dorsal fin. And then with diverticulum, we know that it's a pouch or sac that comes from a cavity or pouch Passage. And so already, just by those two words, we know it's going to be a pouch coming from a cavity on the dorsal side of the bird. And then for proctodial region, the prefix procto refers to anus or rectum. So we know it's going to be by the bird's anus. And then cloaca is a terminal cavity for the intestinal, urinary, and genital canals in birds. It collects all those and it has a vent that opens. So already, just using these terms, we broke down the definition and we know that the bursa of Fabricius is going to be a pouch on the dorsal side of the animal that is near the cloaca or their anus. Okay, so here's some diagrams to help you visualize that. You see here, this is the cloaca on the bird. You can see that the urinary tract comes there and the intestinal tract all go here. This would be the vent that lets the bird excrete waste. So by our definition, we know the bursa should be somewhere over here, dorsal to the cloaca. And then if you look at this picture on the right, you can see that that is where it is. It's very near to the anus in the proctodial region, but it is dorsal, so it's on the upper side of the bird. 
finale. Yeah, and so I mean, remember yeah. we're partners, so I can answer. Okay, yeah. Remember, birds <laughs> don't have a bladder. They have a kidney, they have ureters, but those two ureters join this cloaca where also feces is getting, and that's why when you're on your windshield and the bird passes by mm -hmm. and gets you, that's why it's such a mess because it's urine and fecal matter. All right, so now that we kind of learned about the location of the bursa, we're going to go ahead and learn some about the history. It was first discovered in the 17th century by Aeronymus Fabricius, which is where the name comes from. Although he was able to identify that the structure was unique to avians, he thought it was only present in female birds and acted as a semen receptor, mainly based on its location. It actually wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that its true immune system purpose was discovered. And that was discovered by Dr. Bruce Glick and his graduate student. It was actually an unintentional discovery. Dr. Bruce Glick wanted to determine the purpose of the bursa, so he removed it from chicks. And this caused his graduate student to unintentionally select for bursectomized birds when he vaccinated them. And then when the birds failed to produce the antibody, they realized that it actually was an immune system or a lymphoid organ. Now that's interesting yeah. history there. <laughs> And so they determined its true function as a lymphoid organ. And so in birds, the bursa of Fabricius is responsible for the differentiation of B lymphoid progenitors, which basically means that it differentiates the B cells that um, come from the bone marrow. So it's important to realize that the bursa of Fabricius does not produce B cells, it just differentiates or trains them. They actually still come from, uh, some of them come from the bone marrow in birds, and then they go to the bursa of Fabricius, and then they'll go to a lymphoid organ where they can work to mount an immune response. We're going to go ahead and take a look at the morphology of the birth of Fabricius. In chickens, it is actually a round or oval shape, but in other species, such as the duck, it can be elongated. And if you look at the picture over here, you can see this is the outside. It has a smooth outer whitish surface, and then on the inside of most species, it's Bicated, meaning that it has all these folds in it. And then what the folds do is they cause a reorganization of epithelial surface cells, and then those cells protrude into the membrane as epithelial buds, which is actually going to be important in the histology. So those epithelial buds during embryonic development become bursal follicles. And as we know from some of the other organs we've learned about, the follicles contain a cortex and a medulla. You can see here is the medulla and the cortex, and then this is just a follicle. That's a magnified view. And these follicles are very numerous. In chickens, there's actually 12,000 approximately in the bursa of Fibricius. And the cortex will contain lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages. And then the follicles kind of mature as the bursa of Fibricius matures, and that actually begins in the embryo. So in embryonic days 8 to 15, the bursa of Fabricius begins colonization from pre bursal T cells from the spleen. And then later in the embryonic development, but before hatching, the B cells actually increase and follicles begin to form in the bursa. So that would be up here. <coughs> and then after it hatches, um, the, in, the, in the follicles, there's the cortex and the medulla that begins to form. And then B cells and their differentiation, and once they're differentiated, they will travel to lymphoid organs such as the spleen or lymph nodes. So you can see a lot of the development of the bursa of Fabricius actually happens in the embryo and right after hatch when the chick is still young. So if you look at the graph on the right, on the y-axis we have a mini, a mini globulin A positive cells per focus, and on the x-axis it's number of days. So from day one to day 14, the white bar, which is the bursa of Fabricius, actually increases in its number of immunoglobulin A positive cells. But then by day 28, so after two weeks, it is decreasing <coughs> because at two weeks, it reaches its full size and then it begins to shrink. No, this is after hatching. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, these are not embryonic. This is yeah. yeah. And then you can see on the blue bar, the spleen actually <coughs> increases because that's a lymphoid organ and that's where the B cells go after they're differentiated in the first of Fabricius. So overall, we just kind of learned that the bursa of Fabricius is only found in birds, and it differentiates B cells differently than in mammals. So you can see here in the bone marrow, in both 
birds and in mammals, the B cells are formed. In mammals, they'll go to be differentiated here, but then travel to the lymph or an organ immediately. But in the birds, they're only produced in the bone marrow, and then they'll travel to the bursa of Fabricius, which is where they are differentiated. So in both mammals and birds, they both end up in the lymph cord organs, such as the spleen or the lymph node, where they will act to serve an immune response. And here are some of my sources. Wow, okay. Yeah. I was almost ready to go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just let her do the whole thing. Okay, yeah. Are there any questions? Quick questions, could we have a couple of Where, so you said it goes from the bones to the bursa from Vichyus? Yeah. Does that sound, so the lymph cord organs, a lot of them in birds go to the spleen. It's kind of like the whole kelps where the, the lymphocytes live. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, are birds able to do any sort of passive immunity, like the hens, to their chicks? I do not know about that. That is an excellent question. We should talk about it. But there's antibodies in the egg. Isn't that neat? Okay, so we need to move on, Grace. That was super. Megan, come on down and talk about Vlad. Um, well, Megan's getting up here. That stands for bovine leukocyte adhesion deficiency. I think that's on the video or something. Megan, put that in, and then you'll have to talk about Vlad again. About nine minutes. I'll try to give it a signal. If something will start for you. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Every computer system is so really different. Uh, yeah, birds are different, but they, somebody uh, ask me tomorrow. PAs, listen to this. Tell me to explain a little bit how eggs have antibodies in them. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Well, one thing I saw though is that like, 
it does receive the stimulus that there is an infection, it just can't bind to the wall. Yeah. Okay, so GLAD is mostly in Holstein cattle and it's caused by a point mutation. So one nucleotide in the DNA sequence is exchanged for another, which results in a mutation in the protein. And ultimately it is fatal. So some symptoms are just increased susceptibility to infections like pneumonia, um, and in some of these words, stomatitis and periodontitis are in the mouth, it's inflammation of the gums around the teeth, and then delayed wound healing, enteritis is in the intestine, it's more swelling, um, and then premature death. One thing about the premature death, the death is not caused by GLAD, it's caused by the infection. So a cow that would normally be able to overcome pneumonia or salmonella or something, would probably succumb to that. So that's called a, like a secondary cause of death right. because GLAD will never kill you, but because you can't do that, then you die of something else. It's kind of like AIDS in that Yeah, sense. very similar. And then it's an autosomal recessive disorder. So both copies of the gene have to be mutated in order for the animal to show symptoms. Um, so a normal animal would have both normal genes um, a carrier would have one mutated gene, and they wouldn't show symptoms, but they could pass the gene on to onto their offspring. So if two animals were carriers, they could create an affected offspring. And then an affected animal would have both mutated genes. And would have the <laughs> clinical uh, symptoms of lab. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions? So here around the top here. Uh, I don't think you want to get into that because it gets too much, really. Do you have a question right here? Because, you know, GLAD, it's the, the neutrophils roll around, they can't stop. Ask her right now. Because, you know, it gets, it gets complicated to send you something, really. You know what I mean? I, not that I don't want to, it's just that then people say, oh, this is too much to add assessments tomorrow. You know what I mean? You don't have to remember any of those numbers, because those numbers and acronyms mean a lot. But what's kind of interesting is it was discovered in Holstein, a Holstein bowl that was used for AI. If you're familiar with artificial insemination, and I've been up there like, by Madison, Wisconsin, where the bowls are, are housed, and they're like, somebody could offer a million dollars for that bowl. When I was there, somebody said, see that bowl there? Somebody offered us a million dollars, and they, we wouldn't take it. It's worth more than that because they're genetically superior, they collect the semen, they freeze it in straws, and they send it out. So then one dad can have 10,000, 20,000 offspring. That's a lot of work. Anyway, the problem was one of the bulls, and they didn't know it, was a carrier. And then it was made into thousands of cows, and some of the cows were carriers, and if you've got a carrier mating to another carrier, then go back to that one, it wasn't just the previous slide. Then you get on the bottom, you get the GG genotype. And then that animal <coughs> can't fight infections. It can't make pus. Remember how, this is great, pus is where the neutrophils get out and make pus. They can't make pus, they die of secondary infections. So it's a great little story. That was probably how GLAD was discovered. There's also CLAD, it's also been documented in dogs, and then it's also been documented in humans. And in humans, it's just called LAD. Okay, okay, excellent. And then, Sophia, come on up, and Sophia's going to do oh, arthritis, perfect. We've got a full 10 minutes for arthritis, Sophia. And I'll make a corner, or yeah, you can do thing off plug in. Excellent. Yeah, the Vlad story is very interesting. If you're not familiar with artificial insemination, they collect these bulls, they extend the semen, so a bull can be a father for tens of thousands. I, I can't remember. There anybody familiar with that? I think they keep records of this, and there's one bull that I think has 50,000 offspring. Anybody back me up on that? Those of you that are in AI, I'm an old AR AI guy. This is the hand that goes in because you always use the hand that you don't write with. 
And then, so if you're palpating or something else, then I use coffee too. I'm drinking coffee and the sand's in there. I know that sounds weird. With that introduction, let's take it away. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about can I grow to arthritis? And rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. So we already learned that that means that the immune system mistakes um, your own body for foreign material. And in this case, it affects the synovium. The, so the synovium is the tissue that, um, the connective tissue in between joints. Um, are, you, are you gonna have, oh yeah, there it is. Put, put it out so they can spell synovium. There's a laser pointer right there. There's a green <laughs> Just to make yeah. sure they got that down there. Um, so in this case, the immune system makes rheumatoid factor and that's an autoantibody, so that's just an antibody um, that attacks the body's own cells. And rheumatoid factor, we know that there can be five different um, types of immunoglobulins, and rheumatoid factor is most often found in the IgM form, but it can be any of the five different iso isotopes of immunoglobulins. Um, and the rheumatoid factor targets the FC portion on IgG molecules. So this picture that I have here, here is, should be familiar. Um, it's just the, the general form of an IgG molecule. So then the FC region is kind of that tail region that we know can bind um, to mast cells. So what happens is that the rheumatoid factors bind to the IgG <coughs> molecules um, and then they'll start to form immune complexes. So that means that lots of the rheumatoid factors in the IgG molecules are so, all start to bind together and form this larger complex. And then these complexes get deposited into tissues. So the tissue of the synovium is where they get deposited. Okay, let me go back to that one. So the rheumatoid factor is actually an antibody. Mm -hmm. Okay, so too bad they didn't make that name better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because a lot of times when you say factor, you're thinking of some kind of small chemical or something. But Okay, so the rheumatoid factor is produced in these animals and normally it won't be in people that don't have arthritis or dogs. Right. Okay, so those complexes get deposited into the tissues um, and then that activates the complement system, which in turn will um, activate an inflammatory response. So in this picture here, you can see on the left, you see that synovium that I was talking about, so that's just the red region in between the two Maybe bones. Maybe use your laser pointer. So oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, just this red portion in between the two bones. And then on the right, you can see how it's really inflamed. Um, and then if this inflammation persists for a long period of time, it does cause irreversible damage onto the joints. And so you can see in this picture that they did include some bone erosion. Um, so that's caused by the swollen the inflammation that stays for a long period of time. And so that causes the um, painful and kind of hard to move joints that dogs with rheumatoid arthritis have. So some symptoms that you might be able to see in one of these dogs, like I said, are those painful swollen joints, joint deformity and muscle wasting if they've had the rheumatoid arthritis for a long time, fever, stiffness, lameness, loss of appetite, and dogs do usually get affected in more than one joint. So you might notice one day that they're kind of showing a lot of irritation in their back left leg, and then the next day it could have switched to their right leg, and that's because they'll experience flare-ups where they get more irritated um, at a time when those flare-ups can increase and decrease. So it might seem like it's switching around, but it's always there. Um, and then if you do think your dog has canine rheumatoid arthritis, the, um, the vet can diagnose this, and there are a couple different ways they can do it. They can look for rheumatoid factors in the blood sample, but that's not always the most reliable method because of those flare-ups that I just talked about. Sometimes there's more factor in the blood, and if they're not experiencing the flare-up, um, the vet might, might not notice um, too much of the factor in the blood. So it is more common to do a physical examination. Um, so they'll just check the, jo the joints for pain, um, heat, and swelling that's um, because of that inflammation by the arthritis. And there is no real cure for canine rheumatoid arthritis, but there are some treatments. So that includes steroids that will reduce the inflammation, <coughs> pain medications, um, the hydrotherapy, massage therapy, and dietary changes can all just help alleviate some of that stress that's put on the joints. And then there are there is supplementation that helps boost cartilage production. Oh, 
Okay, go back to the joint, the inflamed joint. And we'll see if we questions first. Anybody have any questions on that? I, I think you made a good point that, you know, it's kind of sometimes cyclical. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the left leg, and then, and it doesn't really, not everything switches to the right leg. It's just that yeah. then the right leg tomorrow is bothered, but the left is still affected. You know, so it's like a cycle sometimes. And what I want to point out is hopefully you, you know that, uh, point out to the synovial fluid form, right in the middle there. Hopefully you know synovial fluid is the fluid that bathes these joints. And there's basically, though that fluid, if you ever take a sample, it should be acellular. You can't get, you shouldn't find anything in there because it's such a fine little, you know, uh, surface that anything in there is going to be a problem. And so you made the point about the complexes. And then the active, so it's complexes first, that's bad because you shouldn't have any particles in there. And then you get activation of complement. Then you get other cells coming to the area because the complement says, hey, come here, the party's here. So you get this inflamed joint and it's a big mess and there's really no cure because the own, your own body is making these rheumatoid factors which are actually antibodies against IgG or IgM or whatever you think of that. So I think the one, one take home lesson is when you say rheumatoid factor, my brain has a trouble that's, that's an antibody, but it is. But a normal animal wouldn't be making those rheumatoid factors. And so how big of a genetic component is it? Um, they, I, what, from what I found, they weren't really sure like what the cause was. <coughs> All I found was that it was suggested that it was a genetic disorder. Yeah. So you've got to remember these autoimmune diseases, a lot of times they might run in family lines, genetic, but then there's always environmental factors that might play a part. And you know, there's that famous genetic formula, P equals G plus E. You guys know that if it's on the assessment tomorrow? P equals G plus E. What is it? Beta hat equals E plus Yeah. Because even if you have a genetic component or genes that are make you prone to something, that doesn't mean it's going to show up in the phenotype because sometimes the environment has an important part to play. Like the dog, if the dog was low weight versus heavy weight, it would show up less often in the lightweight. And that would be an environmental factor, how much food is given. Very complicated stuff. Let's give her a round of applause. And, yeah. Okay, when you guys leave, we need to charge you more tuition. So if you leave, give me a five dollar bill each, uh, no checks, and then the TAs and I are going to go out for lunch. Or otherwise, just leave. See you tomorrow. Or you can give more than five dollars. Yeah, there you go.